So let's just try again. Today, the title of today's webinar is Implementation of Jordan's Principle, Understanding and Addressing Disparities in Health and Social Services for Status First Nations Children Living on Reserve. And with us today, we have two researchers from uh, McGill University in Montreal. We have Vanna Sinha, who's an assistant professor in the School of Social Work at McGill, and her research has, explores the ways that minority and mar marginalized communities support and care for their members in light of resource limitations, restrictions imposed by social policies, and other factors which limit members quality of life and access to opportunity. Uh, and with her also from uh, McGill University is Dr. Lucy Locke, who is an associate professor in the School of Social Work also at McGill and is also an associate member of the Departments of Pediatrics and Neurology and Neurosurgery in the Faculty of Medicine at McGill. And uh, you may recall uh, uh, Dr. Locke was with us uh, a number of months ago with her work with the t uh, CIHR team in Parenting Matters along with uh, a colleague well known to all of us, uh, Dr. Peter Rosenbaum. So, with all of that uh, out of the way, I'll hand it over to Vanna and Lucy. Okay. Um, well, we're going to be trying to do two main things today. We're going to just, uh, give them an overview of Jordan's principle, um, kind of covering the history of the principle, how it emerged, how it's been imp implemented, and bringing you up to date on some of the recent developments around the principle. Um, and I'm going to do that. That, that this is a uh, Wandana speaking, and then Lucy's going to take over, and she's going to tell you a little bit about a, a research project that we're starting um, that's been inspired by Jordan's principle, and we're going to ask people for their feedback on that and uh, try to generate some conversation around you know the, the potential for that project and and what we might be able to do with it. Um, so that's a kind of broad overview, and we'll just jump into things with. Uh, a little introduction to um, Jordan's, Jordan River Anderson, who um, is the, the child that Jordan's principal is named after. Doug, you can go ahead and run that video on your right, Before she goes, she's introducing him to the class. Anderson from Norway House Cree Nation is one of those children. He was born in, with complex medical needs. For the first two years of his life, he stayed in hospital, not far from here, in Winnipeg Children's Hospital. But after his second birthday, he should have gone home. All the services were ready for him to go home. But what did the government of Canada say? Oh, well, it's really good that Jordan can go home. But um, we're not sure we have authorities to pay for his at-home care. The province of Manitoba said, Jordan is a federal responsibility. He's a status Indian child on reserve. We don't want to set the precedent of picking up a federal cost. There's no question about it. If Jordan was non-Aboriginal, he would have gone home that day. But as it was, the government officials thought it was okay for that little boy to stay in the hospital while they argued over who should pay. In making that decision in the first instance, they allowed themselves to cross over that bridge of saying that racial discrimination against a child because no other child would have been denied the opportunity to go home. No other child. That by crossing that river and saying that because he's First Nations, he can stay in hospital while we figure out who is gonna pay from our respective surplus budgets. They then entered into the realm of the immoral. And not just days passed on Jordan's calendars, but days turned into weeks and weeks into years. And this little boy would have other little kids come into his hospital room, and they would all get better. And they would go home. And he was better, and he wasn't going home. The other boys would talk to him about what it is to put both feet into a mud puddle and get all the water spraying upwards or what it is to put your arms around a big dog or to hear the drums in your cultural ceremony. And he had done none of that. He was trapped in the hospital. His family, his community, the doctors and the nurses were all pleading with the governments to do the right thing. Let this little boy go home. But the governments didn't listen. They were afraid of setting a precedent of picking up somebody else's cost. And so it was that just after Jordan's fifth birthday, he lost hope and he dies in, in Winnipeg General Hospital, never having spent a day in a family home. At the time when Jordan passed, we did a study of only eight, uh, eight. 
Just uh, a little bit of the background um, about Jordan River Anderson, who's the child um, who has given his name to Jordan's principal. Um, and you heard Cindy Blackstock, the executive director of the First Nations Child and Family Caring Society of Canada, uh, telling his story, story there. We're going to show the, the uh, URL, URL for their website later, and I encourage people to go to that website um, and learn about the work that they're doing and learn more about the principal. Um, but uh, moving, moving on, we wanted to move from the story of of Jordan and and his you know tragic situation where he should have got ho gone home, but there was this dispute between the governments to the kind of broader situation um, and and the context uh, that led to that to that that tragic case. Um, so underlying that that dispute in Jordan's case is a is a legislative framework in which the federal government has responsibility for providing uh, health and social services to status First Nations people living on reserve, and the provincial government has responsibility for providing services to all other people. There's a, a basic division in responsibility for costs there that can sometimes lead to jurisdictional disputes. Um, disputes over who should pay and, and what standards we should be um, we should be implementing in terms of care and services. Um, but there are also other disputes that come up between uh, government departments, between First Nations agencies and provincial governments. And in fact, the Caring Society did a, a study in 2005 um, that they documented in the Wende report, um, which in where which they surveyed 12 First Nations child welfare agencies, and they, they found that in those 12 agencies, um, people documented almost 400 jurisdictional disputes in just one year. Um, and these were disputes between two federal departments. So, for example, uh, FNIB, the First Nations Inuit uh, Health Branch, and FAC, the Public Health Agency of Canada, or between two provincial departments, between federal and provincial governments, or between First Nations agencies and provincial governments. And each of these were, were situations in which there was a, a family and a child who was in need of services, um, like Jordan was, and in which instead of focusing on how to get services to those child in a timely fashion, people were caught up in trying to figure out, well, who should pay for this and how should we settle that? Um, they found a variation in the number and the types of disputes across across agencies. It was fairly clear that there was some correlation between the geographic location of agencies and the number of disputes with those that were most remote, um, having the most disputes to deal with. But these were time consuming, resource consuming, and, and often very tragic situations for the families and children, the children that were involved. And so it was out of Jordan's story and out of um, the, the understanding that came from, from people's lived experiences and from the kind of research that was documented in the One Day Report that, that Jordan's principle was developed. Um, and before I, I show you, you know, the text of that principle, we just wanted to ask a couple of questions to, to see um, what people know about Jordan's principle. So, Doug, are you going to put those questions up on screen? First question is uh, is up on the screen now, and we have uh, a number of people that are, are responding. So we'll let uh, we'll give everyone a, a chance to answer, and then we'll uh, turn the slide around or turn the question, the results around to the audience. And we'll, so we'll just uh, close that poll off and we'll turn the results around. It seems to be quite a bit of familiarity with Jordan's principle, 80% of the audience saying they are familiar, they have heard of Jordan's principle. Uh, so the second question is, do you understand the purpose of Jordan's principle? And we can see that most, uh, again, a, about 80% of the audience feels they understand the purpose of Jordan's principle, but 16% uh, are, are unsure. And the, the last question? And the last one for now is, have you encountered a Jordan's Principles case in your practice or work? And we can see that exactly 42% have said yes, they've encountered a Jordan's Principles case, and 42% have said no, and 16% are unsure. So back to you. That means that we have an audience that seems to be very familiar with the uh, with the background, and uh, in, we may be uh, we may be showing some of you things that you uh, already are familiar with. But uh, one of the things that surprised me in 
in starting this project and learning about Jordan's principle is uh, just how complicated uh, things turn out to be. So here's the, the text of Jordan's principle as it's been put forward by the, the First Nations Child and Family Caring Society. Um, and I'll just go ahead and read it to you and then we'll, we'll pull out some particular pieces that are of interest. Uh, where a jurisdictional dispute arises between two government parties, provincial or federal, provincial, territorial or federal, or between two departments or ministries of the same government regarding payment for services for a status Indian child which are otherwise available to other Canadian children, the government or ministry slash department of first contact must pay for the services without delay or disruption. The paying government party can then refer the matter to jurisdictional dispute mechanisms. In this way, the needs of the child get met first while still allowing for the jurisdictional dispute to be resolved. So you can see that, uh, yeah, uh, you can, I got it. Um, you can see that it's a, it's a fairly lengthy principle with a lot of different pieces and I've just highlighted here the first part that I want to draw you, uh, your attention to which is the existence of a jurisdictional dispute, right? And a jurisdictional dispute specifically between two government parties, uh, either provincial or territorial or federal, you know, both have to be in play, or between two departments or ministries of the same government. So you can uh, maybe recall that on the slide I showed you before from the Wenday report, they found a number of different kinds of disputes um, between two departments of the federal government, between two provincial or territorial departments, or across the, the government. And there was another kind of dispute which isn't explicitly mentioned in this text, which was a dispute between a First Nations child welfare agencies, which were the kinds of agencies that were being surveyed in that study, and the federal government. Um, and that, that kind of dispute really gets captured here indirectly, right? It's a, a case in which the agency is being asked to implement provincial or territorial standards. Um, so the, the at the provincial level, there's been a decision about what kind of work needs to be done, and the agency then finds that the federal government isn't providing the funding that's needed for them to carry out that work. Um, so it's we don't have direct mention of First Nations bans or First Nations uh, agencies or child welfare agencies or health services, but they're indirectly captured in this definition. Uh, the second thing to pay attention to here is if the dispute is, is, is uh, regarding services for a status Indian child, which are otherwise available to other Canadian children. And this uh, seems quite straightforward. Right, uh, it's a, you know there's a principle of equality and uh, of non-discrimination at stake. And status Indian children living on reserves should have access to the same as as all other children. But one of the things we're going to see as we get into it is that operationalizing that becomes a little bit complicated sometimes when we start to think about well who do we compare to? Okay, um, and the last part that I want to draw attention to in this definition of Jordan's principle is um, that that payment for services should happen without delay or disruption, right? And so again, keeping Jordan's, uh, Jordan's case as an example, um, the, the problem there really was that the argument about whether services should be provided went on for years, right? And during that time, his life was passing and he was stuck in the hospital. Um, and so the principle then is really designed to make sure that that kind of situation where a child and a family's life is put on hold, their needs aren't being met, doesn't happen. All right. um, Jordan's principle has received uh, support from over 7,000 individuals and organizations, uh, including the Canadian Medical Association Journal, the Assembly of First Nations, the Canadian Pediatric Society, UNICEF Canada, the Canadian Nurses Association, um, CAPSI, and it's also received unanimous support from the House of Commons, um, which passed private members bill um, M2296, which I'm going to show you in a bit. So that's the 
the kind of introduction to Jordan's principle, um, a little bit of Jordan's story, a little bit about the kind of context that gives rise to the types of disputes that, that we're dealing with when we talk about Jordan's principle. And now I want to spend a little bit of time just talking about how Jordan's principle has been implemented um, and some of the challenges that, that we see emerging as that implementation takes place. Um, so I'm just going to walk you through a timeline. This timeline is cobbled together from uh, a really wide variety of uh, government documents. Um, and so one of the challenges has really been trying to just follow all the different kinds of communications. But in 2007, there's a member's motion passed in the House of Commons. That's the one that I re referred to um, in support of Jordan's principle. I'm going to show you the text in just a little bit. In that same year, the, fe the federal budget allocated $11 million in interim funding for Jordan's principal cases. So here we have a, a situation in which the House of Commons unanimously supported Jordan's principle and they put their, their money behind that decision um, and set aside funds to help facilitate and resolve disputes in, uh, uh, to facilitate dispute resolution in Jordan's principle cases. In 2008, bilateral, bilateral agreement talks between uh, Manitoba and the federal government begin. Um, in 2010, the Jordan's principle implementation uh, assessment is done by the federal government, so they look across regions and, and do their assessment of um, of how Jordan's principle is being implemented. I'm going to show you the results from that assessment in just a moment. Um, in 2010, the federal government makes a public statement saying that no Jordan's principle cases have been brought forward or identified. So from their perspective, they don't know of any Jordan's principle cases in the country, um, which is a little bit in contrast even to the poll numbers that we just saw with 42% of the people on the call saying that they've encountered a case. In 2011, um, the Federal Jordan's Principal Implementation Team was nominated for an award um, for their hard work on implementing Jordan's Principal. We're going to talk more about the details of what that implementation looks like. Um, in 2011, the federal government again made the statement that there were no Jordan's Principal cases that it had been able to identify in Canada. Um, and in 2012, based on this understanding that there, there weren't any Jordan's principal cases, um, the Jordan's principal fund was eliminated one year before it was set to expire. Um, so we see a, a pretty clear progression here from one in which there's strong support to Jordan's, for Jordan's principal and there's a, a budget allocated to help resolve those cases uh, moving forward to a, a place in which the, the federal government is really saying, well, um, you know, we, we've done what we needed to do and there are no cases that are being identified, so let's use these funds for something else. Now, let's talk a little bit about um, the assessments and the process that led up to that decision. Um, here we have a summary of the assessment that the federal government did of, of Jordan's principal implementation in 2010. Um, they, there were two jurisdictions that were in the process of working on agreements. Um, so some agreements had been made and they were, they were hammering out the details. Manitoba had a bipartite agreement. In Saskatchewan there was a, a tripartite agreement. Um, there were four jurisdictions um, in which the federal government uh, found that the jurisdictions wanted to reach an agreement, British Columbia, Alberta, Ontario, and New Brunswick. And in uh, some additional jurisdictions, the federal government found from conversations with provincial representatives and representatives at the federal level, primarily the First Nations and Inuit Health Branch, um, that, that existing processes were sufficient. I should stress here that um, First Nations weren't consulted as part of that assessment. Um, so, you know, uh, in Quebec, Newfoundland and Labrador, Nova Scotia and Prince Edward Island, from the federal perspective, um, they were told that things were okay, but that information was based really on um, only a, a partial survey of stakeholders. That's the, the federal uh, assessment of the situation. Let's just take a look at assessment of Jordan's principal 
implementation that's been done by uh, non-governmental organizations and look a little bit at the contrast. Um, UNICEF Canada has done its own review and concluded that there are missing elements in implementation which contribute to confusion among stakeholders. The Canadian Pediatric Society has completed two reviews where it rated implementation of uh, Jordan's principle bilateral and trilateral agreements in all jurisdictions. They've gone jurisdiction by jurisdiction and assigned a rating. Um, poor was given to those jurisdictions that haven't adopted a child first principle. Um, fair was given to those uh, jurisdictions in which they've adopted a child first principle. So they've said, yes, we, we believe in, in the ideas behind Jordan's principle, but they haven't developed or implemented any kind of a specific strategy good that they've moved some way, some, uh, they've made some steps towards implementation but haven't fully implemented and excellent the province or territory has adopted and implemented a child first principle to resolve jurisdictional disputes. Um, here are their ratings. There, there are two main things that I would draw your attention to. One, between 2009 and 2011 there's really no change. If the ratings remain the same across provinces and territories. And two, there isn't an excellent anywhere on this chart. And there are an awful lot of poors. Uh, the highest rating that CPS gave was to Nova Scotia, which got a good. They have a trilateral agreement um, between the federal government, the province, and Mi'kmaq Child and Family Services, which is the First Nations agency which does all reserve communities in Nova Scotia. Um, so that's partial implementation, but doesn't extend beyond that. And all the other jurisdictions fall in the fair or poor category. So uh, based on that, UNICEF Canada has argued that full and effective Jordan's principal implementation requires much more than what's already been done, and that it requires a common and properly scoped definition of Jordan's principle, including when and how a claim will be identified. Um, as being a Jordan's principal claim. And I'm going to talk more about those definitional issues in just a minute. Um, UNICEF has argued that, uh, that true implementation of Jordan's principle requires the appointment of an independent oversight body that includes First Nations representation and a transparent claims resolution process that includes standardized comparison and, comparison and assessment methods. And we're going to return to the, the requirements for full implementation a little bit later when I talk about uh, an ongoing court case. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about this, uh, this finding on the federal government's part that there are no Jordan's principal cases. How does that happen? Um, and in our review, what we really started to understand is that there's been a process of definitional and operational narrowing of Jordan's principle that's really moved us from the spirit of a principle that's designed to help children and families who are in need to something uh, that maybe doesn't quite live up to that spirit. Okay, so here's the, the text of the House motion is the first bullet point uh, here. You can see that it's quite broad, broad. In the opinion of the House, the government should immediately adopt a child first principle based on Jordan's principle to resolve jurisdictional disputes involving the care of First Nations children. And below that, I've just taken a, a quote from some of the debate um, leading up to that unanimous passage of the, of the House motion. Um, and you can see that during the debate, there was a pretty clear understanding of Jordan's principle as it's been articulated um, by the Caring Society and um, as it's been articulated by other groups that are really interested in promoting the spirit of Jordan's principle. Um, so, for instance, uh, Stephen Blaney said during debate, when a problem arises in a community regarding a child, we must ensure that necessary services are provided and only afterwards should we worry about who will put put the bill. Thus, the first government or department to receive a bill for services is responsible for paying without delay, disruption or delay, and that government or department can then submit the matter for review to an independent organization once the appropriate care has been given in order to have the bill paid. Right? So this is the kind of discussion that they're having on the House floor when the motion passes. It's clear that, that people are agreeing to a true child first principle where the emphasis is on meeting the needs of the children um, and making you know, questions and concerns about payment secondary. Um, that was passed unanimously um, and so 
that the passage of that motion really represents strong support at the federal level. Now I'm going to show you text of some other legislation. Um, this is text from the First Nations Children Health Protection Act, Bill C-294, um, which was not passed at the federal level. It didn't proceed beyond first reading in the House of Commons. Um, and you can see that it's a, a bill that was really designed to take um, some of those questions of, that are left open in the original text of Jordan's principle and to specify them to say, well, this is, this is what it means. This is how it's going to look in practice, right? And so I've, I've given you a quotation from the text and then summarized some, some points. And it says, where the government of Canada has an obligation to pay for health care services that have been provided to a First Nations child whose ordinary residence is on a reserve, payment for those services should be made within 30 days by the department that is first presented with a claim for payment in respect of those services. The minister of the department that fails to do this um, has to submit a report to both Houses of Parliament uh, detailing the reasons for the department's failure. Right? So there's a, a time limit that's set, set that if we're going to provide services without disruption or delays, that has to happen in 30 days. There's a consequence for failing to do that. You, know, you better come and explain to us why that happened because we, we are putting children first. Um, and there's a, a re uh, dispute resolution process outline. Right? The Minister of Indian and Northern Affairs would appoint someone to resolve disputes if reimbursement from the department normally responsible doesn't happen within 30 days after that. Um, it's pretty clear, uh, it's pretty true to the, the spirit of Jordan's principle, and it didn't proceed beyond first reading in the House of Commons. Um, here I've pulled text from the Jordan's Principle Implementation Act in Manitoba. Um, which is a, a bit broader, a bit less tied to the, the text of the, of the version of the principle that we saw before. Says, Whereas the 1989 United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child states in actions concerning children, whether undertaken by public or private social welfare institutions, courts of laws, administrative authorities, or legislative bodies, the best interest of the child should be a primary consideration. And whereas Jordan's principle states that the rights of the child should be considered first in providing health care and social services, particularly in instances such as Jordan's, which involve complex medical needs. Right, so again, there's a reference to Jordan's principle. Y you start to see a bit of narrowing here, right? Uh, not, not a very severe form of narrowing, but this mention that uh, Jordan's principle particularly applies in cases like Jordan's, which involve complex medical needs. Um, and I, you know, I, you can look up the act, it's available online, and it, again, it, it's very clear in specifying kind of the, the different steps that should be taken, how this thing would be operationalized and implemented, very similar in some ways to um, the First Nations Children's Health Protection Act, um, which has support from a, a large number of First Nations, um, and that one also didn't proceed beyond first bill reading in the legislature. Right. So what we see then is a, a process to move beyond the initial, um, the initial emergence of Jordan's principle and to try to specify it, to operationalize it, to implement it, and that's been met with kind of mixed success, um, even in these early attempts. And now I'm going to show you what's actually been implemented in some place. So I, I pulled the, the definitional, the definition of Jordan's principle um, from the Aboriginal Affairs and Northern Development Canada website. This is the, the definition of Jordan's principle um, that they've been able to agree to in Saskatchewan. I, I should be clear that um, First Nations uh, have been very vocal in saying that they don't believe that this accurately represents Jordan's principle. Um, that it doesn't live up to the spirit of Jordan's principle and that it shouldn't be considered a definition of Jordan's principle, but rather that this is the compromise agreement that they were able to reach in negotiating a Jordan's principle dispute mechanism. Um, and it says a Jordan's principle case involves a First Nations child who is a registered First Nations or eligible to be registered as a status Indian. Um, so that's Know, true to the spirit of the, of the original principle, is ordinarily resident on reserve. Um, and here we have a, a, a new criteria. It has been assessed by authorized health or social pro 
professionals as having multiple disabilities requiring multiple service providers. Right? So now we've seen a narrowing where we go from a principle that's designed to promote um, health and social services for status First Nations children in any category to something that's very narrowly focused on children with multiple disabilities requiring multiple service providers who've been professionally assessed. Um, the normative standards of care are program services and benefits provided to children with similar needs who live in a similar geographic location and uh, Jordan's principal case involves a jurisdictional funding dispute between the federal and provincial governments. Um, so again, we've lost the, the possibility of a dispute between departments um, in the federal government or departments in the provincial government. Now, th this is the definition then that's been uh, adopted in establishing a dispute resolution mechanism in Saskatchewan. Again, uh, you know, First Nations are clear that it doesn't represent the, sp the spirit of Jordan's principle they understand it. And you can see that it's much, much narrower than previous attempts to kind of operationalize and, and define Jordan's principle. And that's a very formal narrowing, an attempt to change the definition. We don't see here language that says um, this dispute resolution mechanism is going to be focused on these types of cases. We're going to start out with these kinds of cases. No, a Jordan's principle case involves. And that's really the, the language and the attitude that's been uh, pretty consistent through the documentation that we've seen from the federal government. Uh, on top of that formal definitional narrowing, we, we see another level of, of narrowing, and that's the operational narrowing of Jer Jordan's principle. So again, here we pulled quotations from uh, documents from Indian Affairs and Northern Development uh, in which they identify the process to recognize the Jordan's principle as involving you know, at least three steps. That case management occurs first at the local level. Um, that a jurisdictional dispute exists that the case is brought to the attention of a focal point and that the focal points are federal appointees who help navigate cases within the existing range of health and social service based on the normative standards of care provided to children off reserve in similar geographic locations. Um, at some level that, that seems to make sense. You know, it's a, a process that you go through. You have to you know, identify a Jordan's principal case. It has to come to to the attention of the federal government. But then when we look at the details of, of how that implementation is happening, um, anecdotally, we, we have a lot of reason to worry, right? Uh, so for instance, uh, we know that the federal government says that case conferencing has occurred on a number of Jordan's principle related cases. They're not calling them Jordan's principle cases, but they're something to do with that. But information about the re resolution is not public. So we don't have any way of knowing how many of these there are, how were they settled, were people satisfied. There's, there's no transparency there. Uh, perhaps even more disturbing, the names and contact information for the focal points are not readily accessible. So AFN suggests to us that First Nations in many regions don't even know who the focal points are. They don't know how they would contact them. And if bringing the case to the attention of a focal point is a necessary step in order to have a case identified as a Jordan's principal case, it seems pretty important that people be able to find the focal points and that, that resources be put forward to advertise those, to make them easy to contact and to support the focal points in being able to devote attention to the kinds of cases that then come forward. Okay, so that's a, a quick uh, run through the kind of implementation efforts to date. Um, and what we see is that it, it's been it's been fairly complicated. On the one hand, there's been a lot of attention to Jordan's principle from different groups across different jurisdictions, people coming forward and saying this is important. Um, on the other hand, there hasn't been a lot of success in, um, in getting a legislation that operationalizes the principle and the agreements that have been made have been fairly restrictive and narrow both in, in the letter of the agreements and in And now I just want to take a little bit of time to uh, talk about uh, the Peak Two Landing Band Council and Marina Beetle versus Canada case that's been going on recently. Um, before I hand things over to Lucy to talk about uh, the research project that's come out of 
out of discussion about Jordan's principle. Um, it, I, this is a really important case, um, not only because it's setting precedence in terms of case law, um, but because the because of the nature of the case, and I'm going to point out some of the things that are really important about it as we go along. Let me tell you a little bit about the background. Um, Marina Beadle is a mother living in the reserve community of Pig Two Landing. She has two sons. One of them, Jeremy, was born severely disabled, has cerebral palsy, and a severe form of autism. Um, Marina was very committed to her son, has uh, devoted you know, her life to not only uh, caring for him, but really nurturing him and trying to understand what makes him happy and what can make him successful to understanding you know, how important music and powwows and cultural ceremonies are for him and engaging him in those. And she cared for him uh, at home by herself successfully until she suffered a stroke. And after the stroke, she sought in-home support to continue caring for Jeremy. Um, the the P2 Landing Band Council covered the cost for in-home support, um, and they asked uh, Aboriginal Affairs and Northern Development Canada to reimburse those costs. The costs were initially quite high, and they stabilized around $8,200 a month, um, which is, is less than the cost of uh, institutional out-of-home care for a child, um, and which allowed her to keep Jeremy at home connected to his community, his family, the things that he loved, and also allowed her to keep him at home and to keep him from engaging in self-harming behaviors that they'd observed when he was out of that setting. Um, they had a case conference at the local level, as the federal government suggests should happen. Provincial representatives were consulted, and they indicated that $2,200 a month was the normative standard for in-home care. Um, and that institutional out-of-home care was the only alternative. Okay, so this is the first step uh, in, term, in terms of the PIG2 landing case and Marina Beadle and Jeremy's um, side of things. But there's a, a parallel series of events that are happening, which is that there is a, a case um, making its way through the Nova Scotia court system, and there was a Supreme Court ruling that came out just about the time that this case conferencing process was taking. Um, that case is Nova Scotia versus Boudreaux. Uh, Nova Scotia versus Boudreaux. And in that case, there was a family living off reserve, a non Aboriginal family, also had a severely disabled child, also wanted help uh, providing care for him in home. They were given the $2,200 a month, and they found that it was insufficient in order to attract and retain qualified caregivers. And so they had discovered that in the legislation, there was a clause allowing for. Um, for the provision of additional funds in exceptional circumstances, and they brought this case, court case forward, claiming that they that it was uh, violating that legislative clause that they were being denied more than twenty two hundred dollars, which was needed in order to provide basic basic care for their child. Supreme Court found in favor of Boudreaux. Um, ruled that the Nova Scotia had an obligation to enforce the legislative cause clause allowing more than $2,200 in exceptional circumstances and found that, that Nova Scotia couldn't just uh, decide to ignore legislative clauses in, for the sake of, uh, of financial efficiency. Um, that court ruling came out. Uh, the Pictou Landing Band Council was aware of it. They forwarded that decision to the focal point that was, uh, that was in charge of hearing Jeremy's case during the time that the decision was being made. So you have a parallel decision, a uh, decision in a parallel case. You have the Pick 2 Landing Band, Band Council taking the initiative to inform the federal government of the decision in that case. And still, um, and still you have a situation in which the, the federal focal point determined there was no jurisdictional dispute. That in conversation, the province between the province and the federal government, the determination was that, well, that Supreme Court decision didn't really apply to this case because in practice, in practice, Nova Scotia was still continuing um, with this policy, which the Supreme Court said they could not continue with, um, which was of, of limiting payments to 2,200. 
um, and the Pic2 Landing Band, Band Council and Marina Beadle said, well, that's not right, and they filed a case against Canada invoking Jordan's principle and the Charter of Rights and Freedom. That was in 2011. The ruling came out in 2013, a very strong ruling in favor of the Band Council and Marina Beadle. Um, and the judge, uh, Judge Mandeman, found that Jordan's principle applied in the case because the Pictou Landing Band Council delivered services in accordance with provincial legislative standards and the federal government refused to pay. Um, so there was a dispute there. But the appointment of focal points um, represented federal attempts to implement Jordan's principle and that the moment they decided to implement the principle, they incurred a responsibility to actually live up to Jordan's principle. It wasn't enough just to say, oh, well, we did it. It had to be something that, that worked. Um, that Jordan's principle is not to be read narrowly and that the absence of a monetary dispute is not determinative when officials of both levels of government maintain an erroneous position and both then assert that there's no jurisdictional dispute. Right? So the, the judge here is really saying to the, the province and federal officials, well, it's not okay to collude about these things and get together and decide, well, we're not going to pay more. That doesn't make the dispute go away. It doesn't make the the denial of services to a child in need go away, um, and that normative standards of care should reflect official legislation and standards, not de facto practice. And I can't stress enough how important this last piece is. Um, you can imagine if there was a ruling that normative standards of care could be based on de facto practice and they didn't have to reflect official legislation. This would really put us in a situation of racing to the bottom in terms of the quality of care that will we were expecting um, to be provided for children. A strong decision uh, seems quite clear, seems quite clearly in favor of a principle that's based on um, you know, the idea that children's best interests should come first and that we should treat children equally regardless of, of their, um, whether they're First Nations or not. Um, and Canada has filed an appeal, and in their appeal they assert that the judge was wrong in his interpretation and application of Jordan's principle, wrong in his assessment of the Jordan's principle focal points decision, wrong in the remedy granted to the respondent, and they also reserve the right to introduce other um, reasons for the appeal as they go along. So again, a very broad-based appeal, another indication that Canada is uh, is fairly committed to fighting true implementation of Jordan's principle, um, and that's where things stand right now. Um, that's a brief interview, uh, overview of a, of a fairly troubling and, and sad series of events, I think, um, and it brings us to a research project that's been inspired by Jordan's principle. Okay, so I'm going to, it's Lucy Locke speaking now, I'm going to take over from here to, uh, to describe to you this uh, project that's been inspired by uh, what Wanda has just uh, described to you. This is a uh, partnership uh, that is emerging and uh, currently the, the current partners include uh, our center here at McGill, the Center for Research on Children and Families, uh, the Assembly of First Nations, the Canadian Pediatric Society, UNICEF Canada, and of course the Canadian Association of Pediatric Health Centers. So there's some um, key research questions. Uh, I first would really like to stress that we're really just starting um, starting out. This is this is ground zero that we're at, and uh, and so we're we're hoping to um, get a sense of whether there are structural differences in the processes uh, that exist for accessing or providing health and social services for status First Nations children living on reserve and, uh, and whether there's a difference between those children and children who are non-Aboriginal. Uh, whether there are differences in processes for accessing or providing services. Uh, and whether these differences result in disparities in the nature of access to or continuity of services for First Nations children living on reserve and non-Aboriginal children. So our goals are to document administrative procedures, standards or other structures 
that shape the processes for accessing or providing services. Secondly, we'd like to contribute to a greater understanding um, of the disparities that, um, that may exist in health and social services and to provide a foundation upon uh, which to build um, a, a subsequent phases of research. So again, stressing that this is the beginning. So what we're hoping to do is to engage you um, as representatives of, of uh, children's hospitals across Canada, uh, as well as to en engage child welfare agencies, which Wanda has already started. I don't know if you want to say a few words about that. Um, just, just that we're reaching out to a small number of child welfare agencies and trying to walk very systematically through their decision-making steps to document where there are differences for First Nations so we basically are wanting to do the same, uh, go through the same process with the uh, pediatric, pediatric centers across Canada. Um, what, we, what we're suggesting uh, to do is to start with um, two situations. It gets a little bit more complicated, um, but one is, a, is sort of a case study or case example of a child with a chronic condition. Uh, such as global developmental delay, and a child uh, with an acute condition, namely meningitis. And um, what we're interested in is uh, whether there are differences in, um, or, or whether there are differences between First Nations and non-First Nations uh, kids in, at the intake uh, process or at the admission process or at the discharge or transfer process. So we're, basic, so we're interested in both inpatient and outpatient processes. We're interested in comparing non-Aboriginal children to First Nations children who are, who are uh, theoretically from the same community, and uh, First Nations children who are on reserve to a First Nations child in a neighboring off-reserve community. So we're hoping, for example, to discuss with, um, with representatives what are the processes involved in admitting a child with global developmental delay uh, or in discharging a child um, uh, with global developmental delay uh, from the hospital back to their community or from the hospital to a rehab center. Similarly, what are the processes involved in admitting a child from a First Nations uh, community um, uh, with who, who is query meningitis, and how would that compare to uh, admitting a child who's non-Aboriginal? Um, similarly, how would that compare to a child who is First Nations but is in a in a neighboring off-reserve community? So these are uh, we're we're in the process of structuring some questions around around this that uh, we're hoping to roll out um, by speaking to doing some key informant interviews. So really, this is the first phase of research. It's exploratory. Uh, we don't have any hypotheses that we're testing. We're simply trying to lay the groundwork um, uh, and trying to build in flexibility into the design uh, to, uh, to follow up uh, on the interview uh, data. So we'll be doing key informant interviews. Um, we'd like to have opportunities uh, or provide opportunities for participants to help to shape the future direction of the research. So really an exploratory study uh, as is warranted, I think, at this stage. Um, we're focused on collecting systems level information, not specific case-based information. Um, so, so really interested in asking you about, you know, how do kids with flow through the system, come in and out of the system, both out of the inpatient system and the outpatient system. We'll be presenting um, uh, and analyzing the, 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 the data, but um, only um, presenting aggregated data, so we won't be identifying you know, what province uh, uh, certain you know, individuals are from. So uh, the anonymity of everyone is going to be protected, as well as the anonymity of specific hospitals or child welfare agencies. Um, and really the, the interpretation and the framing of the findings will be done collaboratively with our research team here and our organizational partners that I mentioned earlier. 
Okay, so this is, uh, did you want to add anything, Wanda? No, I think that, uh, that you know, gives an overview of the study, and then we just wanted to get people's feedback by asking some questions, which Doug could probably put up for us. Yeah, we'll take it over to you, Doug. See the next uh, poll question up on the screen? Um, just asking, how interested would you be in learning about the results of this study that uh, Lucy has just described? So it's not at all interested, somewhat interested, or extremely interested. We'll just close that one. And it looks like uh, most people uh, are extremely interested. 64% are extremely interested. And this one's a simple yes or no. Do you think children's hospitals are a good focus for this study? All right, we'll close that. Uh, and again, 79% said yes, they, they do think this is a good... Uh, 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 the children's hospitals are a good locate a good focus of the study. Um, we'll do the next one. Do you think cases involving global developmental delay are a good focus for this study? Yeah, we've uh, you know arbitrarily chose two two conditions, two diagnoses. It may not they may not be the best diagnoses. Um, we frame this as a yes no question, but. Uh, if, I guess there, there's some kind of mechanism for people to uh, provide input in writing, and maybe we can, we'll talk about that towards the end of the presentation. People are thinking a bit more about this one. The answers are not coming in quite as quickly. Yeah. <laughs> so people could actually send us input as you know as comments or questions during the webinar, or if you want to take some more time and think about it, we'd love to get email from you as well, and we'll give our contact information by the end of the webinar. All right, we'll just close this one off. Uh, and 80% uh, and, and said yes, they do think uh, global developmental delay is a good focus. Uh, the next one is regarding meningitis, and do you think uh, cases involving meningitis are a good focus for this study, yes or no? Responses are in here, so we'll close this one with uh, uh, with 67% uh, uh, saying that yes, uh, meningitis they feel is a good focus for the study. So I'm um, really in, be interested in those who said no. What you know? What alternatives they would uh, they would consider? Yeah, if anyone has an has an alternative, just feel free to type it into uh, into the question box, and we'll we'll see some of those responses. If anyone who did say no has uh, has uh, something that they really feel would be a better choice, uh, please let us know. Uh, yeah. So the um, what we're what we're going to be asking uh, representatives from pediatric hospitals to do is to engage in and commit to doing a one and a half to two hour phone or Skype interview. We're very flexible in terms of what format is used. Um, it can't, may, maybe it'll be done all in one session, uh, it might be done over multiple sessions. Um, the, what the interviewer would be one of us, either Wandana or myself or um, Anne. Uh, we'll ask for permission to follow up as well with any questions that emerge afterwards. Um, the notes from the interview will be sent to participants for verification. Um, the individual participants in the hospitals they work for, as indicated earlier, will remain anonymous. And then our plan is to hold a second webinar for participants only, uh, where uh, you know participants will have an opportunity to again. Uh, provide feedback on, on the preliminary findings that we would present at that time. So what we're wondering about is um, are there ways of, you know, identifying who the best people are at the uh, local level, um, at the hospital level to participate um, in an interview. Um, and uh, you know what we've what we know so far is that there you know this really varies from hospital to hospital as to who would be the person or persons most likely to be able to answer questions regarding structural processes and procedures for getting kids in and out of the hospital. So sometimes some places have specialized teams. Um, other, in other places, these are individuals, uh, discharge planners, uh, sometimes they're social workers, and sometimes they're, they're practitioners, physicians, nurses. So every center would, you know, knows best 
who would be able to answer those questions? Yeah. Just a segment of those questions is really just asking, uh, it's, the, it's those statements that uh, Lucy just had up on the screen that uh, apply to describing your practice. So please check all that apply. This is a sort of a multiple response answer, so you can check all of the boxes that apply. So you work with clients from both on and off reserve communities. You work with children involving... Uh, I thought we changed that. Perhaps I didn't. Uh, we work with children involving global develop, developmental delay. Uh, you work with children, uh, cases with children involving concerns about meningitis. Uh, and uh, you are, uh, or you are a part of a specialized Aboriginal First Nations team. And we had a number of suggestions, a lot of them, and you can respond to these maybe after we get through the, this in the next uh, question, but a, a lot of people focusing on the uh, global ve- developmental delay and suggesting things like autism and, and other uh, disorders like that. Right. As, up, as okay. opposed to global developmental delay. But, uh, we'll just close that off. So just for those of you who are interested, most people are working with uh, clients in, in both on and off reserve communities. Uh, certainly much less are part of a specialized uh, Aboriginal team. But that's uh, interesting. Mm, interesting. Results, uh, okay. Um, and the next uh, question. Oh, and the next question if you didn't see this coming throughout the presentation, uh, <laughs> would you be willing to participate in the study? Yes or no? <laughs> setting us up with uh, some interesting background and then uh, setting the hook here at the end to get some people actually willing to participate. There's no, there's no commitment set in stone at this point. It would just uh, A yes here would just mean that we would send you an email to tell you more about the study and follow up. And, and we recognize, and, and or I, at least I recognize, I see the, the participants and where they're from, but uh, our presenters might not. We do have a wide range of people, including people from uh, that are, are family representatives and that sort of thing, where they, it may not be appropriate. So we have a few no, quite a few no's coming in, but it may be that they are not from one of these types of organizations, a children's hospital or, or otherwise. So. And share, we have 43% have said, said yes. And again, I think it's uh, just the nature of where some of the participants are, are based, uh, the types of organizations they're with. And the I next, the next, qu- <laughs> yeah. and the next question is even better. If you're not willing to participate, maybe you can uh, find someone who is. And would you be really, perhaps a, a colleague of yours would be more appropriate for participating in the study? And again, uh, you're, you're definitely not committing them. We're not going to hassle them. It would just be a matter of us sending you an email saying, hey, by the way, do you know anyone who would be good for this? So I'm learning lots about the, uh, the audience here. <laughs> I don't know if this is a reflection on their willingness to work, but they're certainly willing to find someone else to do the work for them if they're not. So that's, <laughs> I guess that's good in either way. <laughs> Perfect. So there you go. So back over to you. All righty. So this is a slide that just uh, gives you our contact information. Um, there's some. There's the First Nations Caring Society uh, website um, uh, address. Uh, I mean, it's an interesting website to look at, but more specifically, information about Jordan's principle is on there. Um, that's uh, Wandana's uh, uh, email, my email, as well as Anne uh, Blumenthal, who's been uh, really helpful in uh, in tracking some of this information down, working with us, uh, a graduate student. And uh, you can certainly go on to Cassie's website to down. You'll provide more information about that, eh, Doug? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yep. About uh, how to access today's presentation. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, we have a number of questions. If you're really ready to tackle some of these, I think so. All right. We'll start off with a simple one. Someone asked right off the beginning: Is there an age uh, range around Jordan's principle? Is there? Is it a limit of 18 years old, or is there anything any documentation around an age limit? I've never seen any documentation around an age limit, but I would imagine that there are age limits mentioned in the specific agreements um, that have been worked out in in different jurisdictions, but I I haven't seen an age limit that I can give you offhand. That's a really interesting question. That's a very good question. Um, the next question was, again, the, the, some of these came right near the beginning of the presentation. This was when you were talking about the federal assessment in 2010 about need for agreement. Uh, they're, they're, they were asking why, why the territories were not included on the slides. Um, in the document, they only mentioned one territory. They mentioned the Yukon, and they said... Um, Okay, just checking. Um, they said that there were ongoing talks, but that's all they mentioned, and the other territories were left out of that document. 
so I don't know why. So again, this is information that we have pulled out of um, either official government documents or more often out of documents that have been obtained through access to information um, by the Caring Society. Um, and so it, it's hard for us to speak to the federal government's motivation. Um, what we've tried to do is just is just document the information that we could get from the doc from what's available. Sorry, that's not a very satisfying answer. <laughs> It's an honest one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the next question is about, uh, you were talking about uh, the, the section about implementation uh, and where it's at across various provinces, and in particular the Canadian Pediatric Society's assessment. Uh, someone noticed uh, that Ontario is not listed on that list. They were wondering where they were there. Is that true? Yeah, I'm looking. That's, I'm, that's certainly a mistake um, on our part. We will add them and update and and do you think you could just pull up the the report card on the other computer, and we yeah. could uh, we could go on to the next question and come back and tell you where Ontario is uh, in their rating uh, in just a minute. Would um, that work? Yeah, no, for sure. Okay. Um, they were on the list. The slide about federal Im the implementation assessment, where they are a jurisdiction that wants an agreement, but they, they just were not on the pediatric society's uh, slide. There. Yeah, and they were definitely the, yeah. the pediatric society's report card definitely included them. Okay. Um, yeah. So, but and you can you can yeah. see online and just we're we're pulling it up right now, and we will add it to the slide before we post. Um, but maybe we could move on to the next question while we're looking that up. All right. Uh, this next question came in when you were talking about um, sort of the, the criteria for identifying a Jordan's principal case. And this person is asking: instead of requiring multiple dis uh, requiring multiple disabilities, uh, if you required instead the severity of the disability, if that was part of the criteria, do uh, do you guys think that uh, more cases would have been understood as being within the spirit of Jordan's principle? It's really hard to say. I mean, there, there are so many different things layered on top of each other in, in that definition. I mean, there's a question, first of all, about just access to diagnostic services and use of diagnostic services, right? So it, it's probably the case that we're losing a lot of Jordan's principal cases just from the get-go because people aren't, aren't going forward to get something assessed. Um, so that that never gets identified as a as a, a health or social service need. But it's a really good question as to what constitutes a multiple a multiple disability versus a disability period. Uh, you know, you could have some. You can imagine somebody who's got very severe cere uh, situation. You know, all GMFCS level four of cerebral palsy, um, and and you know, is that enough? Or, or do you have to, is it a tail wagging in the dog kind of phenomenon where you're going to have to layer on multiple diagnoses in order to substantiate uh, what constitutes a multiple disability? It's a, I mean, it's, it's a really, really complicated series of questions. I mean, on the one hand, when you implement a program, you have to start somewhere. So to identify a set of cases to focus on or to pilot a project with, I, I think is understandable in any kind of an implementation process. But to move from that to changing the definition of a principle and saying, well, these are the cases that are Jordan's principal cases, they, they don't seem like the same thing to me. You know, on, on the one hand, you, you have a, an understandable need to take things step by step. Um, but you're still trying to live up to the spirit of a principle which should really apply to all children, whether they have disabilities or not. Um, and, and on the other hand, you have something, I think, which really doesn't fit with the spirit as well. We just found the information on Ontario, and the rating in 2009 was fair, and in, in 2011 remained fair. Um, more specifically, a child first policy to resolve jurisdictional disputes involving the care of First Nations children and youth has been introduced and discussions with the federal government are underway. An implementation plan is still needed. So that's where Ontario is at. And the, there's, a, there's a link to the report card in the references that are on these slides. So if you go and download the slides after, it will give you um, a direct link to the report card. All right, sounds great. 
Uh, the next uh, set of questions are are uh, all came in during the section about about the research study. Um, we, uh, the first one was when you were talking about uh, you described the organizations that uh, you're connecting with child welfare organizations and children's hospitals, and the comment came in about uh, child well uh, child welfare agencies in that. Disability and health services are also provided by other community agencies. So not sure if it's just a comment or if it's a question of why why focus on child welfare agencies as opposed to other community uh, health and disability service providers. It's a really good question. And the answer, again, may be dissatisfying, but it has to do with the, with the fact that it's an exploratory study. You know, initially... You know how these things start. We started with the grand plans of trying to document Jordan's principal cases, you know, across the country. That's clearly beyond the scope of what we can do right now. And so we started to narrow down and narrow down and narrow down. And child welfare agencies are are one of the the areas in which we have a lot of connection. We're able to facilitate easy, you know, easy access. Um, and to and to find people who would be in a position to answer our questions well. Um, they also an area in which Jordan's principle often gets played out in fairly complicated ways. So, for example, if we look at the the Nova Scotia example that we talked about with uh, Jeremy and uh, and his mother Marina Beetle, um, they were at some point told by the federal government that one one possible scenario, one thing that could happen in their case is that the situation in that home could deteriorate so much that child welfare would get involved and then Jeremy could be placed out of home, right? Um, and so child welfare services end up being in a, in a really complicated, playing a really complicated role in some of the cases that we've heard of, um, where on the one hand they're being called in directly to address um, needs and and, um, and risks in the family, but on the other hand, where they become kind of the, the agency of last resort when needs and, and risks that could have been addressed in other ways um, aren't taken care of. So, it's, uh, so children, the other thing is that children with disabilities do represent a substantial proportion of kids in child welfare. The, um, the, the study that was done by Don Fuchs Linda Burnside in Manitoba, I think, put it at, I believe, it was up 30, 33% of kids in, uh, in child welfare have a dis some kind of, now we're not talking about the multiple disabilities category, but some kind of an identifiable disability. So the short answer is it was uh, child welfare agencies are agencies to which we have a lot of access and context and um, which you know, are kind of central to Jordan's principle in a lot of different ways. Yeah, we, uh, we're now into the section of the questions where people were putting in suggestions for other uh, other diagnoses and conditions that might be considered. Um, and, and again, a, a few uh, suggestions of autism uh, related to the global developmental delay, or instead of, uh, some people are suggesting in addition to global developmental delay, uh, suggesting that they should also have a complex health care need or severe degree of delay of some sort. Um, we had a number of in, uh, suggestions for traumatic brain injury or metabolic disorders. Uh, we've had a number of suggestions for uh, cerebral, I mean, a number of make the list, including cerebral palsy, spina bifida, muscular dystrophy, um, and, and, a, and a number of others all, all make the list. Um, so we, I can certainly send all of this information on to you so you can sort of scan through it. Um, uh, another, uh, there were a couple of uh, questions about uh, hospitals uh, and someone suggesting uh, or a comment came in about, you know, when we were talking about uh, looking at hospitals for this part of the study or the segment of the study that you were discussing. Um, and the person is suggesting not just hospitals for the study. And, and a couple of comments like this have come in about asking First Nations people directly across the country as well, um, suggesting there might be biases in the system and that sort of thing. Right. Think, Sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I was just, was just going to ask if yeah, you had any comment I, on that. but. We, you know, when you think about uh, tackling this issue, it can be tackled from multiple angles and certainly going to the First Nations communities themselves and speaking to, you know, to people on reserve um, is another approach. And that it may, in fact, be what we do, some, uh, you know, somewhere down the road if, uh, you know, in, in collaboration with our, with our partners. Um, uh, and this is, I guess, 
frame that's why we framed this as a beginning and laying down some of the foundation work um, you know tackling you know trying to simplify it you know do something that's manageable achievable um, and and take it from there um, so this is I, I would say that this is a beginning it's not an end I would also say that it's a beginning that that we developed working with our partners really to complement the kind of information that's available right now. There have been a, a number of extremely courageous and committed First Nations um, parents and First Nations communities that have been willing to step forward already in, in different settings and different forums and to share the details of their story and to say, look, this is this is a uh, you know this is what's happening to us. That's a that's a Jordan's principle situation. Um, and in in working with our partners, one of the things uh, that was clear is is that you know it those stories are out there, and they I don't want to say they're being dismissed because it it hurts even to say those words, but they're not having the desired impact in terms of moving the policy discussion. Right? So there's been an approach to those that, that um, oh well, that's a, a single situation, right? That's you know because of the community or the hospital or there's something specific to the case, and what our partners had really identified was a need to try and and complement those stories and the you know our knowledge of the really tragic real life situations that people are dealing with with something that would bring some numbers. Um, I don't know why somebody would be moved by numbers when they're not moved by the stories, but let's just say that it helps to be able to present information in lots of different ways. And so what we wanted to do was to, to start by complementing those stories with information about just, you know, at a systematic level, if we look across jurisdictions, we look, you know, in a number of different settings, well, what are the commonalities that people can observe? What are, where are the places where there's extra paperwork or different lists of providers or different lists of Drug. drugs, um, where there are different protocols that have to be that have to be observed, and how do those things cumulatively add up to a different quality of service and, and eventually a different quality of life for the First Nations children that, that are, are coming into contact with health services and with child welfare services. Any other questions, Doug, that we you, could talk? We've got a few more minutes left, I think. Yeah, we've got about uh, five minutes left, so I think we, we've got one more question on the slate, one more question and one comment, that I'll go over both of those. So if anyone has one more burning question and their fingers are flying on the keyboard, we might take one more after this, but uh, I think we may wrap it up after we get these two. Uh, one comment is about uh, Saskatchewan doesn't have a children's hospital at this point, so may not be able to participate in the study, but uh, I think uh, from, from our perspective, uh, Saskatoon Health Region is considered one of the 16 uh, pediatric academic health sciences centers because of its affiliation with University of Saskatchewan, et cetera. So uh, they, they do qualify uh, in not in children's hospital physical buildings terms, but they would be one of the academic children's health science centers. So no worries. You're still still able to participate. <laughs> uh, and the, another comment was, was, what's that? And we want you to participate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's very important to have participation from Saskatchewan on, on this issue. It'd be great to have their, their input. Um, and the last comment is uh, from their perspective, many of the health care issues that involve jurisdictional disputes involve home care services, respite care, and autism services. Uh, so there may be better sources of, inf of information other than children's hospitals. But perhaps that's even for follow-up studies and, uh, and, and a long uh, program of research uh, to follow this as well. Right. Yeah, that's, uh, I think this has a t potential certainly to evolve into a program of research where, you know, you can just keep chipping away at the different dimensions and different understandings and different sources of knowledge that exist to, to actually create a, a clearer picture of what's going on. We did, we, we have talked a, a bit with, um, with people in community practice settings. Um, so it's something that we've been exploring, but again, in, in the first stage, we're kind of balancing a number of different goals um, and limitations, right? So one is, you know, what can we get access to? And, and the second is really that we want to be able to, to put together some results fairly quickly, right? This is a situation that's affecting children and families right now. We have 
partners who are very committed to trying to see change happen and to see you know, more meaningful implementation of Jordan's principle in the short term. Um, and so to children's hospitals um, turn out to be a setting that we're able to access relatively quickly with the help of organizations like CAFSI. Um, and so we're starting there and we'll, we'll build from there. All right. Well, that's, uh, there were no uh, last minute burning questions. So that brings us to an end of this, uh, of our session today. So I'd really love to take this opportunity to thank our presenters. I've, it's a great, it was a great presentation, really provided, I think, a lot of clarity and background of, of what we know of, of what uh, is happening with Jordan's principle right now. So uh, a big thank you to, uh, to our two presenters from McGill. Well, thank you for inviting us. And thank you as well to the attendees for, for listening in and participating. Yes. Thank you. And we will continue to uh, work to get uh, everyone connected with this research uh, program. So if uh, the, the inf their contact information was up on the slide previously, I also have put up the page on the Knowledge Exchange Network where all of this, the recording for this uh, session will be posted, uh, as well as the, the PowerPoint presentation. And, and we'll also put their contact information. And the other thing we wanted to encourage people to do is, is if, you have, if you have registered, and anyone can register an account on the Knowledge Exchange Network, if you have any suggestions, there's a comment section at the bottom. Uh, please, please feel free to log in and, and post a comment on on other you know any of the questions that we posed around uh, the research program if you have any suggestions of identifying you know Jordan's principal cases in your area that you think uh, that, that you'd like uh, you know just to, sh to that you think would add uh, to the conversation here uh, please uh, feel free to, to use the comment section at the bottom to, to keep this conversation going around this issue and and uh, again, we'll, you, we'll be emailing uh, people the, the information when all of this information is up on the uh, Knowledge Exchange Network. And we encourage you to contact us and contact Lucy and Vanda uh, later on if, you, uh, if you're interested in more information or participating in the study. So thanks again to our presenters and to everyone for joining us. And we hope to see everyone on our next webinar. All right. Bye, everyone.